This is the No Stroke Podcast with your co-hosts, David Dancero and Michael Garrow, helping you to support and thrive in life after stroke. Their podcast is designed for educational and community support purposes only and should not replace medical treatment and guidance of your own health professional team. Hi, Pam, and welcome to the No Stroke Podcast. Thank you, Mike. What an honor to, um, to be able to speak about the challenges that stroke patients and their caregivers have uh, once they've had a stroke. Thank you for this opportunity. Of course, of course. And for all your accomplishments and awards within you know, the field of stroke, you're saying before we started recording, this is your first podcast. So yeah. it's our honor to have you on today, Pam. Um, you know, we've been able to connect uh, through uh, a previous uh, episode, actually. So well, backstory, I suppose, is, you know, I, when David and I first started to really work together and dive into this stroke field, um, we've, we've came across your research. And that was about six or seven years ago. Um, and, you know, I, we, we then just kind of highlighted some work from the American Heart Association's conference that happened about a month or two ago at this point. Um, and, it looked like yeah, as I went through the program, this compass P CP model stuck out. And, and I was like, wow, you know, this is something that, you know, I've been seeing for so long. And now, you know, it, it was on center stage of the health innovation um, forum within at the American Heart Association's conference. Um, and, you know, we were able to get connected and really have a great conversation um, and learn about, you know, the, the mission you've been on for for years now. Um, and I wanted to start with a recent award that you got. So backtrack now to 2020, and you were awarded the David Sherman Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and for those who aren't too familiar with this award, um, it recognizes lifetime contributions in the investigation management, kind of mentorship within the field of stroke. Um, so I'd like for you to one, talk about what that award meant for you to really receive and, and be given this platform at the American Heart Association's conference back in 2020 to speak on, you know, your contributions and what led you to you know, receiving this award. Um, you know, it's, you have such a, a deep, rich history within stroke. Um, and I'm, you know, fascinated to, to be able to have you on and, and dive deeper onto some of these things. But Let's just start with, you know, Pam Duncan, what, what led you into stroke and what, you know, gave you this amazing accomplishment with the David Sherman's Award? Well, Mike, thank you. Of course, that was an honor of a lifetime to recognize uh, my career that has been dedicated almost 50 years to improving the recovery and quality of life of individuals who have stroke. And Certainly, most of us are motivated motivated by our own personal experiences. And early in the 80s, my mother had a stroke, a mild stroke, um, and really um, did not manage her secondary prevention programs very well. And then she had a major stroke. Um, and I just was always, I walked out of my uh, physical therapy degree and worked on a stroke unit um, at New York University and um, really had at that time the opportunity to spend extended time with stroke survivors to optimize their recovery and stroke prevention. Um, and I really felt that I should dedicate my career uh, to improving access to rehabilitation services, to provide the evidence for it, and also to be advocates for patients and their families to narrow the gap in stroke care. So it was indeed an honor and it was a pleasure uh, to do this. Um, the title of my presentation was Comprehensive Stroke Care, Is It Time for a Paradigm Shift? And whereas the value and the incredible progress that we've made in acute stroke care has increased the survival rates and quality of acute stroke care, that level of attention to care has not transitioned to 
discharge once the patients are discharged or access to rehab services. So I call, I see it as a call of action uh, among the neurological and stroke community that we can truly do better. Uh, Pam, um, thank you so much for, 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 for joining us. Um, also, um, for this being your first podcast and also the, you're only our, um, if you include myself, you're our second P our third PT on the podcast. And we're, we're, we're on episode 41 here. So, um, we always find, first of all, when Mike described the work that you did with the Compass CP, we, we both had that aha moment when we, when we read your work and we said, finally, someone, <laughs> we're on the same page with someone who sees disparities. And I did listen to the replay of your uh, receiving, receiving the award and the presentation you described. And I wanted to ask, there was something that really stuck out there. And I thought it was a great line where you said, Houston, we have a problem. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you mentioned where we, there's this disconnect. Can you talk about what some of your work uh, uncovered in terms of um, your mission and what you described? So Houston, we do have a problem and healthcare in the U.S. is in crisis. Um, and the most vulnerable in this crisis are the elderly with chronic conditions. And stroke is simply an example, one that I carry a tremendous interest and passion for, where the patients are vulnerable. They have decreased variability, uh, uh, tremendous variability, increased variability in access to care and decreased um, knowledge of what services that might be available to them even in their own communities. Um, so that was really the important point here. And I would also add that that healthcare crisis is increasing. Um, the payers have limited uh, benefit for access to rehabilitation services. And if there is access, uh, as uh, the New York Times just did a great article on uh, advantage plans and called them Medicare disadvantage plans, um, because they are not uh, providing access to services, even though they may code the patient as complex. Uh, but in addition, it's uh, less decrease the length of stay and get them to the first available bed, uh, irrespective of quality. Um, so what has happening is that with this escalation in the problems, not only in the United States, but worldwide, uh, we are causing tremendous economic, but most importantly, social burden to the patients and their families. And we're not optimizing their recovery or quality of life. And where, as we in the United States recognize this and we write policy papers on systems of care that now say, well, we should do better. Um, the Europeans now have a stroke action plan that they called out uh, specifically that the definition of comprehensive stroke care is not just acute care, but access to rehabilitation and secondary prevention. Um, other countries like the UK now actually are man mandating that patients be followed at six months and there are national audits. In the United States, we don't have those quality programs in place. We don't have the mandates to follow these patients after their stroke beyond their acute care, and they are falling into abyss. And as we demonstrated in our COMPASS work, um, all generated by what we call stakeholder interviews, patients and caregivers uh, are very satisfied with acute care but as the favorite quote from one of our stakeholders was, I was life flighted in and I was parachuted out of the hospital with a hole in the parachute. Now we have programs that have tried to address that and hold health systems responsible for readmissions. Um, and Medicare has put in place transitional care payments, chronic care management payments, remote monitoring payments 
payment scale. But in the reality, health systems are not motivated to do this. And that's what we found in the COMPASS study because it isn't an immediate financial benefit to them. So let's, let's dive deeper into this COMPASS study and kind of, you mentioned, you know, you walked into a stroke unit right after PT school and you've been in, you know, the stroke space for so long. Um, you know, what, what led you to get this funding, you know, from PCORI back in, what was it, 2014, 2015? 2014 when we began. Yeah. So it's not well, like you, you saw all these problems building up, right? Yeah. So, you know, this, you know, getting to the point where, you know, you structured your research, um, you know, you had your lifetime work of seeing these problems happening. So let's, let's dive into, you know, what, what this Compass CP model really aimed to achieve um, and some of, you know, the, the outcomes of it. Michael, um, what has happened in my career is collectively, I've probably had over $100 million of funding to evaluate uh, what I would call reductionist interventions to improve stroke recovery. Uh, and it hasn't had an effect. Uh, some of the uh, interventions that we have demonstrated evidence for is not available in practice um, and not implemented in practice. So timing is everything. Um, and what happened in 2011, the Center for Medicare uh, and Medicaid said, look, we really have to move beyond acute care into managing these patients better post-discharge. And they, I said, well, this is an opportunity. Stroke is a, a very uh, high risk condition. Patients are very vulnerable. They have existing comorbidities. They are discharged. So why don't we take advantage of this opportunity and take the Medicare codes uh, that in which they pay providers to manage the patient. And let's just work across 40 healthcare systems, randomized what we call by clusters to see if we could implement this. And if we could implement this, would it improve the patient's quality of life, their functional status, reduce mortality, improve their blood pressure management? And so this was a perfect timing to say, okay, how do we move what we know should happen to frontline healthcare and evaluate it? That was the motivator. I really didn't want to end my career by saying, oh, it, it's not being implemented, right? So it was, it was a big motivator. Can we, can we dive into sort of what, for those that aren't familiar with the care pathway, what does that workflow look like and, and what, yes. you know, what's, what's behind that? So uh, I, I will tell you in the COMPASS program, what we did is we said, when patients are being discharged from the healthcare system, they should be immediately approached that uh, we will follow them up uh, with a transitional care call. And we will ask you to come back so that we can do a more comprehensive assessment of the residual deficit you may have that may not have been detected in the hospital or was not set forth with the proper management. So the workflow is you approach the patient in the hospital, you certainly message to them on the major risk factor <laughs> Uh, for recurrent stroke is blood pressure control. We call them in two days, we interview them and we develop individualized care plans for them. And then we link them to community-based resources. For example, one of the biggest factors in, second, in, in management of a stroke uh, patient is they don't control their blood pressure well after the stroke, less than 50% of the patients recover, their, manage their blood pressure. And well, what, what, what's driving that? It's not just your uh, doctor didn't prescribe the medicine, but can you afford the medicine? Do you have residual cognitive deficits that were not um, 
recognized that would influence your ability to manage new medications. So let us understand what are the social and functional drivers of your inability to manage your medicine. So how do you do that very quickly? And so we did that. And also we linked them to community-based resources to say, oh, in your community, here is where you can get drugs at no cost or drugs with a, at a low cost, uh, or you may need to have someone assist you with your medicines. So the workflow is identify the patient immediately when they come in the hospital, discuss follow up with them at discharge, call them at two days, understand the critical factors at two days, especially medication reconciliation. Are you planning to see your provider? Have you, have you uh, accessed rehab services that were referred to you? And then we will see you in seven to 14 days. We will do a more comprehensive interview assessment with you and your family to see how you can manage your health. We will coach you, give you an individualized care plan, and we will refer you to community-based resources. That was the workflow in Compass. And it was 100% consistent with how Medicare had set the stage for transitional care management. And there was reimbursement to health systems to do this. I, and I love you know, the name Compass, CPIT, right? You're, you're really navigating, not only helping the patient navigate and you know, their care, their you know, a survivor possibly, you know, who's, who's kind of in the mix, but I wanted to take a deeper dive into this, um, into the care team, right? Because we spoke about healthcare, you know, nurse burnout and some of the, the, you know, the stress that's put on the system there, but this, and we also spoke about, you know, kind of a lot of these, the research and some of the work that we've done previously seen not implemented, right? But what's unique about Compass CP is you've built this directly into Epic already, right? So it's yeah. it's a seamless flow um, for the the nurse navigators who, you know, are already stra <laughs> strapped with so much work and a and a and a large workload to manage, you know, multiple different patients. So, can you speak from a from the nurse's point of view, you know, how this aids in their workflow and kind of how it's integrated, you know, within Epic as well? Absolutely. Um, uh, so nurses and physicians want to manage their patients comprehensively, and they want to seek to understand their patients. Um, and there are a lot of uh, top down, do this, do this, do this, but without an appreciation of the time and uh, resources it takes to do that, right? Uh, and so in, in parallel with this vision, we said, how do we make this more efficient for the nurses? How do we make it relevant to the patients? And how do we communicate to the providers? So uh, initially in the Compass study, we did it on a research platform, but that's not generalizable. So now we have put this in, uh, we've used innovation and informatics to immediately identify the patient within EPIC as soon as they're admitted. We have now generated the questions in a very simple format where if you answer your X on this, we can skip. So we made it efficient in time. And then most importantly for the nurses is that once they've interviewed the patient, which on the average takes 10 or 15 minutes, uh, is they can immediately generate the care plan. I mean, immediately generate the care plan. and they can decide, as you well know, there can be many problems that patients have. They can decide the priorities that they're going to address with the patient. And they do it in the context of the patient's goals. The first question we ask is, what are your goals for recovery? And then they communicate with the provider. So they let that provider, the nurse practitioner or physician know, oh, we interviewed the patient. And guess what? they're not taking their medicines and they can't afford their medicines and they don't understand their medicines because when the patient comes back to the doctor and the blood pressure is out of control, what do they first start doing? Changing the medicines. Did you have time to take a deeper dive and say, oh, are you taking them? Can you afford them? So we do that. I will tell you in our system right now, 
we have reduced the nursing staff required to navigate this by over 50%. And in addition to this, we have a product called Now. Uh, it's always an escalating innovation in, in, a, in discovery. Okay, this is fine, but whoa, we need to be able to understand what happened to them in the acute side as well. So now we're merging it with what we call the Stroke Navigator Program, which is actually required in every health system in the country by JCO to look at your quality indicators for acute stroke care, abstract your records to see if you're compliant and report it to get with the guidelines. We now have, are merging those two. That program alone has decreased uh, the, the time to manage uh, that quality program. Uh, we, we use two nurses now where other health systems are using five or six. So we've increased staff efficiency but we've done it with a, as, as my colleagues say, a clinician driven perspective, not an IT driven perspective. We know what needs to be evaluated. We know what needs to be asked. We know what services to refer them to. And we want to make sure that they have access to those services. So now we have a, a new product that we are merging, Navigator with Compass CP. With that, we can look at the patient's entire journey. We can look at the patient's entire journey. Yeah. I would also, also add one other thing that we learned is that transitional care visit is necessary, but not sufficient uh, because these patients have long-term standing issues with their uh, recovery as well as with their secondary prevention. And in our new funded projects, we're looking at focusing on blood pressure management to bring in chronic care management and behavioral coaching so that you can have use those codes. So we are on a journey and we are going to transform the trajectory of, of care of these patients consistent with all these policy pa papers out there. But in order to do that, we have to bring innovative technology and comprehensive clinical views and uh, in integrating both the the rehab and recovery programs, as well as the primary care. We are on a journey to make a difference. So, Pam, um, you're, you've put together this incredible accountability plan to give survivors and caregivers the best opportunity for supporting that transition out of the acute phase. We talked about the efficiencies that this can perform or allow for nursing to free up and allow them to maybe um, continue to treat in other ways or, or affect the outcomes. But where is the real, so the, there's always has to be a champion in this. And they always had, you talked about the, at the prescribing side, how do you get to the neurologist so that they can set off this chain of events that needs to happen to get the best outcomes? Is that, is that how how critical is that, and how are you uh, uh, you know perhaps addressing that in some of the early stage work that you've done with this? So David, you are right on. <laughs> okay, so along with our evaluation of Compass, we did an implementation analysis and we looked at the characteristics of the sites that were highly successful, and they all had a stroke champion, and they also recognized the gaps in post acute care. And their health systems were also motivated to provide the resources to implement. Um, and the stroke champion always starts with uh, the stroke neurologist who's head of that stroke service as well, very, very importantly, uh, the stroke program manager. So those sites that had very, um, committed champions that they wanted to expand their care beyond the walls of acute care were highly successful. And they also had the support of their healthcare system. So that's critical. Now, as you read the current uh, news and air, healthcare systems say we're losing billions of dollars, billions of dollars, 
And now they're attributing it to staffing problems with nurses, for example. Uh, you've got to demonstrate an ROI to healthcare systems. Now, I think David and Michael, and certainly my passion all of my career has the ROI is the quality of life of the patient and, 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 uh, and managing secondary prevention. I hate to say in acute care settings, that's not their ROI. The ROI for the acute care setting is uh, how much money am I saving? And the ROI now is to improve efficiency so it will not take nurses so long, but you are exactly right. Not only in our compass work, but now as we're out looking at uh, multiple healthcare systems to be able to market this device to, they all say exactly what you said, David. Oh my goodness, if this can reduce my time of my nurses to um, abstract charts and quality, if this can reduce the time in my nurses of writing by hand a care plan, now they can pay more attention to the patient. That's exactly verbatim what was said. They can pay more attention to the patient. And now I can demonstrate to my healthcare system, this ROI will contribute to patient satisfaction. The one thing that we found consistently in all our work, we improve patient satisfaction. And it is a big quality met metric for healthcare systems. Yes, multifaceted. Yeah, and you know, let's let's talk to really like where you're because you, you, yes, we have these champions throughout. You know the the system. You know for for stroke, and you're one of them, and you're connected with many of them. But there's also centers, you know, really in these rural parts of <clears throat> the country, even the globe. You know where where stroke care, you know, might not be as advanced, you know, and those are the area, you know, outside of city pockets, you know, when we think of getting access to immediate stroke care, like that's where a lot of the money is gone when we think of like innovation and stroke, you know, getting a patient, you know, to do a telehealth appointment and, and ensure, you know, get that brain scan done early and, you know, helping the people who can't get to you know, an advanced center straight away. So what, how are you focused on kind of helping and, and you know, we spoke a little bit about, you know, the commercialization of this product, but what's your road, like, how do you see this going from, you know, the research site down at Wake Forest, you know, partnering in with your local health systems, obviously you have many connections in the world of stroke, but, you know, for this to really touch as many lives as possible, how, you know, how are you guys approaching this? And, you know, how do you see your growth here over the next couple of years? Well, exactly as acute stroke has managed this and how, how, how did they do it? They developed telehealth programs where there was uh, central uh, discussions with neurologists at bigger centers. So uh, you are exactly correct. And what we are doing now is looking at telereach models, right? So what we, you don't have to come to the healthcare system to have a comprehensive assessment, interview assessment. So we are looking at uh, reaching out by telehealth to the patient and then the caregiver to do these types of assessments. And we then know, even in rural North Carolina, I'm from North Carolina, there are access to services in, in your community, right? Every, every, county in the country, for example, has to have an area on aging program where you may get access to assistance through the area agency on aging, or you may also have um, uh, pharmacists that will give you low cost med medications. But so we see that the future of this is to do telereach. And again, Medicare has put forth remote monitoring as now a billable code, uh, but the failure of that's very high uh, because people, uh, all of us, you and I included, have to have a certain level of function and tech savvy to do that. So how do we support through telereach? So I think the immediate uh, answer to your question is, it will not be the only solution, uh, is telereach. The other one that I'm very passionate about and 
is in the Biden um, new legislation is, is to increase public health nursing. And uh, we, we, we actually need to start looking at in some areas to go back to the old public health nursing model uh, to help manage these patients. So there are different programs uh, available depending on where you live. Everybody doesn't have uh, access to the internet to do tele-reach, but we do have programs local in communities like the Area Agent on Aging, and I think we need an expanded workforce of public health nursing to reach out. But, but when I say public health nursing, it's just not nursing, it's public health therapists and others who can go and go into these rural communities and help. We do it globally. What, what happened to us in the U.S.? Well, let's talk about that, right? And it, and I, I'm fascinated because I, you know, I we spent some time in, in when David and I early started our work, you know, and and I was in Ireland, so I got exposed to that, you know, model over in Europe and you know parts of Australia as well. And you know, we'll be speaking to a few guests from Australia in the new year. Um, but what, like, what will it take for us here in the states to be able to have these models that you know really put you know, skin in the game for providers and payers to care about these long-term outcomes for, for stroke patients, you know, where, what, where's the missing gap for us? And what do you, well, what do you, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'll go back to the UK model, mm. UK national health service, because there was a huge advocacy from stroke survivors and their families that the national health service we are not doing well in the community. So we have to start with advocacy. We have to look to the American Heart Association to be major uh, partners, but also major community level leaders to get advocacy. Now, what the UK and the National Health Service did, it was that advocacy that brought it forward. And now the UK has put in the place that all stroke survivors and they have community networks uh, in the National Health Service. And you will do a six month assessment and care plan for those who've had a stroke. So they've looked at it as a chronic problem. And I hate to go back to financial incentives, but they said, if the community providers don't do that, there will be a 1.5% reduction in their provider payment, right? So that's an example of how other countries have done it. Uh, and it has to be at a policy level. I was just approached by the American Heart Association to lead a writing group to write another paper on policy. And I said, in all due respect, I'll be at the table, but what are we going to do to implement that policy? And implementing that policy in our complex system requires, requires that we advocate for changes in our reimbursement policies. Uh, and, and that becomes a conflict sometimes when we're trying to get payers to change, but they've got to change, right? And CMS has to hold systems accountable too. For example, let's look what, uh, Florida has done. Florida is the most advanced state in stroke care management, and they have legislative mandates that if you want to treat patients acutely, you have to have certain quality standards in place and certification. And now, if you, there are 169 hospitals across Florida where EMS is directed to take the patients because they're prepared. Now, what does Florida want to do? They want to begin to develop programs that will ensure that patients will go where they will have access to comprehensive management. The European mm -hmm. Stroke Advocacy Policy Paper for 2018 to 2030 redefined comprehensive stroke care. It has to include secondary prevention and recovery. So yes, we are making progress. I think we should look to our colleagues in Florida 
and see if we're successful in doing that. But that was legislatively mandated. It was legislatively mandated. I, I feel like in many ways, um, you, know, you, you may be you may be our, our last guest of the year here in 2022, but I feel in many ways like that could be an entire season for us, Mike, like talking about the reimbursement and, and following this, you know, making change happen. And it's so, you know, it, it it's so important that you, you bring that up. And as, you know, as, as we, as we kind of close out our conversation here, um, being mindful of your time, um, you spoke at the beginning, Pam, how, um, your mom's experience that kind of defined a path for you in, in stroke. Um, we also had a conversation, um, in a, in, in a separate meeting about your, do you feel comfortable mentioning your recent, um, personal experience, um, with, well, if I can not cry, uh, <laughs> I, I would, <laughs> but I, I, sorry, I, really but... Want, I want to share with you that, as I said in the David Sherman lecture, if we all live along enough, either our families, our children, our daughter who had catastrophic preeclampsia with an incredible outcome, or you will have a stroke. And that was in February, 2020. And in April, 2020, I didn't have a stroke, but I had a bike accident and I had two ICH bleeds. And I had the best of acute care possible. Absolutely the best of acute care possible. I live 10 minutes from a rural hospital that doesn't have a neurointensive care unit. They immediately recognized what happened. I was life flighted and to the University of North Carolina Health Sciences Center. I didn't sit in the ED. I was immediately taken to the neurocritical care unit and I was given textbook management. Textbook management. A 70 year old woman who falls has ICH bleeds has more than a 90% probability of dying. And also if survives has major long-term disability. So I want to applaud the acute care management. It was phenomenal. But then I became the victim of the post-acute care. I was discharged after I woke up from a coma, being in a coma for two and a half days, I was discharged in less than 24 hours and advised to see my primary care doctor. And the wonderful young neurosurgeon says, you're no longer a surgical candidate. You are just, you are our, you are our miracle for the week. And I said, but I have head trauma. I have ICH bleeds. You've shown them to me. I, I, you know, I passed your quick cognitive test, but I'm pretty loopy. I'm lethargic. You know, have you seen me walk? You, you keep doing focal neurological exams, but have you seen me walk? I have very impaired balance. He says, well, you know, COVID's here. We got to get you out. What's my follow up? See the primary care physician two weeks. I said, okay, get me out. And I get out of the hospital. My husband drives two hours to get me, brings me home. And that night I started cramping all over my body. Now I was cognitively enough with it that know that this could be a bad outcome of the osmotic therapy. But Pam Duncan had enough cognitive awareness and medical knowledge to know that this is not normal. And I had access, immediate access to my colleagues at Wake Forest Baptist Health, Dr. Artie Sarwal, who's the head of neurocritical care, told my husband, call her, call her, call her because uh, I think I have an electrolyte imbalance. She immediately woke up in the middle of the night, looked at my chart from UNC and my potassium was dropping. It had dropped to a dangerous level and it wasn't recognized and I was discharged and my potassium was 2.3. That is near lethal. I was immediately taken to the local hospital infused with potassium. So I survived that. 
Second, I needed therapy. It was COVID. Nope, you can walk. You don't need our services. And by the way, you're overinsured. Not underinsured, you're overinsured. And we don't have time to deal with repayers. This is Pam Duncan. I had the knowledge and the access to know what I had to do to recover. And I'm speaking to you today as someone who's fully recovered, except I still have balance problems if I'm in complex environments. And Michael and David, I've been blessed in my career. I've been given the biggest awards in the world. But if we don't make a difference, it happens every day. So every day I get up and I say a prayer of gratitude. Dear God, I beat all odds. What is my continued purpose in life? And even though I am transitioning to retirement from chasing millions of dollars in grant, I have a new level, a new level. You did mention that in 2020, I also got the Advocate of the Year Award from the American Heart Association. But I don't want to be just a talking head. I want to be at the grassroots and I want to create opportunities for all patients and families, irrespective of the absolute corporate greed of health systems, payers. We have to do it different. I will be at the table. And I have on my wall a saying from Irma Brombeck, when I meet St. Peter, I hope I've used my last talent. So I will continue to use those talents. I have been a victim of the healthcare system and poor coordination of care, but I am a survivor. Thank you so much, Pam, for sharing that story. And wow. you, uh, you know, there's there's no better way to to see the disconnect than, than go through it yourself. And and for all the work you've done, um, I couldn't imagine, you know, that that experience, you know, having to go through and see the disconnect still being there. Um, but we're so proud to have you on today, Pam, and and you know, talk to us, share that story share your experience and really what you're, you're driving to change. Um, you know, there's so many stroke champions out there and we're, we're lucky to be one of, you know, those stroke champions that, that are behind your cause. And, you know, for us to, to round this, you know, year out with, with that story and the work you're doing. And, and I think the level of optimism as well in your, in your words of, of what can change and how you're driving this change. Um, you're going to make the difference and, and we're just so happy to to have you on and share that, share your words and, and be part of the change. Well, Michael and David, we are going to make the difference because what we're doing is we're, we have to make available in wide dissemination all your incredible work about no stroke uh, because we have billboards out there about what are your symptoms, but no stroke. So I would say that I'm very privileged in my life. I'm very privileged to be connected with you, but we have to escalate the message. And I do believe in my old age, I'm not the media expert. As I said, I've never done a podcast, but we've got to use this technology uh, to, to do it. And I'm very cognizant, Mike, of your work with vendors like CVS and others. They also have to come to the table because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody usually walks into a pharmacist, right? And so we have to take it as our community benefit. It is our community benefit. Uh, health systems are required for community benefit. It is our community benefit. And so I want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to figure out how we can continue to collaborate with you and I'll help you set up the line of speakers and patients and anything because <laughs> I believe no stroke no stroke is what we have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. And I, I'm, I'm convinced you're going to make St. Peter proud. You, you, <laughs> you, 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 thank you for sharing. Thank you for that. Thank you. We couldn't have ended the year, like Mike said, in better fashion and with better 
alignment of our causes. So um, thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Okay, bye-bye.